All right, well, again, good morning, everybody. I see that there are 28 of you, 29 of you logged in, that's great. Um, the presentation this morning is about um, why you should care about open data if you're a GIS professional in New York. This is a presentation I gave uh, originally at the Long Island GIS uh, conference about a month and a half ago, and uh, I made some revisions this morning, and I'm happy to give it to you now. So I want to start with, um, the state's open data site, which is data.ny.gov. I'm, I'm hoping that many of you have already had a chance to visit this site, but my experience when I've asked groups uh, to, you know, for a show of hands, how many people have been on the open data site, it's been rather underwhelming. So uh, this is one you want to want to pay attention to. It's data.ny.gov. There's also an alias set up for open.ny.gov. Either of those will take you right to the site. Um, as of this morning, there are uh, 9,473 data sets on there. You can sift them and, and view them in a lot of different ways. The default sort is on most popular. Um, there's a quite a bit of uh, geospatial data in here. Uh, one of the ones that I've, I think is kind of nice is there's a, there's a file from the health department on uh, restaurant inspections. So uh, you can look up your favorite restaurant and see how they fared on their most recent uh, health department inspection. For example, just as an, an example. All right, so how did this all happen? Well, uh, the governor uh, issued an executive order, um, and this is the from the governor's uh, page where he lists all his executive orders. So uh, this is something he can declare on behalf of the executive branch of state government. And the details of this executive order, it's Executive Order 95, EO 95. Uh, it's about 16 months old. Uh, May of uh, last year, and um, what it does uh, is, is it creates um, this open data website that is run by the agency where I work, the Office of Information Technology Services, and it requires that all executive branch agencies comply with the executive order, and in, then it encourages other government entities, state uh, authorities, for example, and local governments uh, to to uh, join and participate and post data on the state's open site. Uh, there's a requirement that agencies have to identify their publishable, publishable data and uh, create a schedule of how, the, how they're gonna get that posted on the state's data site. And I think it's noteworthy that the definition of data in that executive order specifically includes geographic information systems data. I wanna also point out who the, who the leaders are uh, for the state's open data activity. Uh, first of all, Andrew Nicklin has been appointed by the governor as a director of Open New York. And Andrew is actually on the webinar this morning. Good morning, Andrew. Glad to see you there. Um, Barbara Cohn is uh, the ITS uh, chief data officer, and she manages the staff uh, that are actually implementing the, the Open Data website. And she's the one that's dealing with the executive branch agencies to, to do the compliance work with the, with the executive order. The governor also established uh, two advisors. Oh my God, is my phone? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, two special advisors. Uh, one is uh, for for the Open NY policies. Uh, Teresa Pardo, who many of you may know as the executive director for the Center for Technology and Government over at University of Albany. And the uh, the second advisor is an Open Data advisor, uh, Professor James Hendler, who is the director of the Computer Science Department at RPI. So that's the, that's the leadership team in New York that's responsible for this activity. I want to um, start with, a, with what I'm going to use as a commonly understood definition for open data. You see open data, the term bandied around a lot, but um, what does it really mean? So my definition of it is, first of all, uh, the data has to be machine readable. Uh, you'll see this over and over again in, in uh, descriptions of open data. So you can't post a PDF and call it open data. It has to be something you can digest and consume, use in, in other systems. Um, and the, the, co the most common formats we see in the, um, in the GIS world are shape, uh, keyhole markup language, or KML, which is now an OGC uh, standard, and GeoJSON. Those are very popular formats. Uh, the data has to be posted online and downloadable or directly accessible via an open API. So, the fact that you might post your data on a public public facing website, for example, in a map viewer that you might have at a you know local government level, 
if the data can't be directly accessed or is not directly downloadable from that viewer, that's not open data. That's, that's publicly displayed data, but it doesn't meet the definition of open data. Third, and very important, open data is always free. There's never any, any charges associated with it. And along with that, it needs to be free of use or redistribution restrictions. Now that uh, most of the time means it's free of a license, but not necessarily. Uh, what you sometimes see are licenses such as a Creative Commons license, which doesn't restrict you from using the data or redistributing the data, but it does uh, require that you attribute the source of the data, for example, under a uh, Creative Commons Level 1 license. Um, typically also, uh, data providers that uh, pr uh, provide open data are indemnified. That is, they are held harmless. So if you use the data, you can't then sue them for problems that occur as a result of your use of the data. Uh, obviously, if, if this wasn't the case, that would stymie a lot of people from, from wanting to release their data openly. And the last point is you, you generally want to see metadata or descriptive information about the data set. So if there's you know, definitions of what the fields mean and all, all that sort of thing, uh, uh, information describing how the data was compiled, when it was last updated, and so on, uh, all the common metadata elements are highly desired. I, I do want to point out, too, that uh, you, you sometimes see some confusion between open data, as I've defined it here, and crowdsourced data, which are not necessarily the same thing. So for the purposes of, of everything I'm going to talk about this morning, the definition above is what, what I'm referencing. Um, Bill, I'm going to one uh, question. Oh, sorry, yes. Bill. Uh, there was one question. I don't know if you want to take that now or if you want to take it at the end. Or it okay. was, uh, what I is an OGGC so. standard? Yeah, so there is a group of, um, of uh, vendors uh, in the geospatial uh, sector that have all joined forces, and it's called the Open Geospatial Consortium, the OGC, and they have published a number of uh, standards to provide interoperability among uh, software vendors. So uh, there's some common uh, web mapping standards, uh, the, the WMS uh, web, uh, web mapping system is, a, is an OGC standard, for example, and, and they adopted KML, which originated with Google as, a, as an OGC standard as well. All right, so um, I want to shift gears here and, and do a few little case studies. And I'm starting here in Minnesota. And um, something very interesting happened in Minnesota uh, recently. This is a status map of, of openly published data sets as of the uh, end of last year, December 31st. And I want, to, I want you to pay special attention to this area down here, the, the this is the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro region. It's the, you know, it's the heavily populated part of the state, uh, state capitals down there, seven county area. And as of April 23rd, so in, in the span of four months, those counties uh, in the metro New York area have rapidly shifted to a free and open data policy. So let me go back. So this is December 31st. Only a couple of counties, three counties in the state had open open data policies that, well, the data was freely available without a formal policy, I should say. And four months later, uh, the metro region uh, had gone gangbusters for open data. So what happened there? This is a kind of an interesting story. So there's, there's a, a, an organization of those seven counties in the metropolitan region called Metro GIS. And the Metro GIS has a policy board, uh, and the policy board adopted an open data uh, policy and, and encouraged all of the seven counties in their metro region to enact that policy. And I, I've circled here a, uh, a link to a document. This is a really, really excellent document, and I highly encourage you to, uh, to access it. Rather than giving you the long URL, if you just Google Metro GIS open, you'll end up on this page, and, uh, and there is the document. And, I'm, and this is actually the title page of that document. I've, uh, I've circled uh, the name of Jeff Moss, uh, who is the, uh, one of the principal authors on here. And I, I think he was going to be on today's uh, uh, call. Oh, yes, I'm looking at the list here. And Jeff, well, welcome. He is on the, on the webinar today. I had uh, several exchanges with Jeff, a couple of phone calls. And uh, he provided me much of the information that you're going to see here about the, what, what 
the story is, the very interesting story that happened in the, in the Metro GIS region. So this, this report, it's a 75 page report. Uh, they put a lot of effort into researching the issues surrounding uh, policies on uh, sale of data versus uh, publishing it as open data. And so here's what, here's what that report contains. And again, I, I highly encourage you to, to uh, take a look at this thing. So one of the things they do is they debunk three myths about making data public. One of them is that organizations can pay for GIS operations through geospatial data charges. So what did they do? They, uh, they actually you know, looked at the books for the counties in the metro region that had a history of selling their data and discovered, not surprisingly to some of us that have done similar analysis, that it was not uh, uh, a substantial moneymaker. Second myth, that data can't be shared in the interest of homeland security and personal privacy. And what they point out in this report is that there are strategies to deal with that. So you you redact to the extent you, you need to certain pieces of uh, private uh, privacy or homeland security data, uh, but not you don't have to wholesale hold back uh, entire data sets. You can there's plenty of data that you can you can release uh, without getting into problems with homeland security. And the third uh, is uh, myth is that if you share data, others may misuse it and blame you for the mistakes. And this leads to some analysis they did of indemnity clauses, and they concluded, rightly so, that uh, that's easily handled uh, through an indemnification. The report also points out that uh, the investments in public GIS data have been growing. And furthermore, the public has much better tools to uh, leverage that investment, home computers, software, now, web access, all these things that didn't uh, exist in anywhere near the capacity that they, that they used to, now make it very easy for people to consume the data if you make it available. And that the way to, to leverage that is to, is to put the data out there. It doesn't do much good for people to have capacity to access your data if you're not releasing it. So uh, the bottom line in this report is that they concluded that uh, government should make that data available to everybody, not just uh, people with deep pockets that can afford to pay a, a licensing fee for it. So again, uh, excellent report. They've detailed everything in the appendices, the uh, you know full disclosure on on the analyses that they did for all to debunk these things and so forth. So really a really a fine report. All right, so here's what the Metro GIS board did that caused that that four month shift in the map. They adopted at the board, they have a policy board at Metro GS and they, they adopted a policy of open uh, geospatial data release. And then furthermore, they sent letters to the, uh, to the seven counties in the Metro GIS region, urging them to adopt county resolutions to enact uh, an open data policy at the county level. And in fact, they even provided a template uh, resolution. So you just fill in the blanks here. Just fill in your county name here and uh, have your county uh, adopt this resolution so that there will be consistent policies across the, the region. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, in the span of just a few months, you, you have uh, five counties that have uh, adopted that, that policy. The remaining two, when I talked to Jeff most recently, one of them was, uh, I expected to do it very shortly, and the other is simply resolving a few technical issues, uh, and they are definitely on track, and, uh, and Jeff expects that to happen uh, sometime uh, over the next year. So we had a dramatic turn of events in, in this most populous region of, uh, of Minnesota. Now, you might ask, how did that happen? There's usually a champion in these things, and um, this gentleman here, Randy Johnson, who is a county commissioner in Hennepin County. Hennepin County is the county that contains Minneapolis. It's the juggernaut county of Minnesota. 20% of the state population lives in Hennepin County. And Randy Johnson is uh, a significant elected official there. And Randy Johnson, for those of you who, who maybe haven't paid attention over the years to some of the national issues, has uh, been very prominent in the GIS scene over the last 15, 20 years. 
He's been the chair of the National Association of Counties GIS Committee. In fact, they've had that committee for something like 15 or 20 years. He's always been the chair of it. And so he's a strong advocate of GIS, and he's also been a strong advocate of licensing and selling data. So for, for many, many years, Hennepin County uh, has been licensing their data sets and generating revenue from it. And in fact, Randy Johnson has gone out and spoken at many conferences over the years about these policies. In fact, I've heard him once or twice, and a very passionate speaker. Um, here's, a, here's a quote I like from Randy. He said uh, he likes to tell a story that GIS is so useful in local government that he's challenged anybody in Hennepin County that if they can identify some county program that won't benefit from GIS, he'll buy them lunch. And he has yet to have to pay for lunch for anybody. Um, so what happened with Randy? Randy read that report, that policy report. And this is, a, this is a quote taken right from the minutes of the policy board meeting. So Randy went to that policy board meeting and, and he changed his mind. And he says here, in the early days of these discussions, I championed the idea of selling our data for recovering the costs of developing it. And I have changed my mind on that. Now this is, this is really kind of breathtaking. As Randy, Randy Johnson, he's a, he's a dyed in the wool Republican free market guy. This is uh, Hennepin County where the, you know, in, in his district in, in uh, Hen Hennepin County is the, where the Mall of America is, the largest shopping mall in the United States, you know, kind of a citadel for uh, consumer capitalism. And, uh, and he changed his mind. Wow. And what happened after he changed his mind? Boom, you saw the metro region of, of uh, the Minneapolis, St. Paul area all, all change course. And here's the Hennepin website. Um, and you go to their site and right on the, the most prominent words on the page now are open GIS data. And the first data set is their tax parcel data set, freely available. And it says on there, these county data sets are being shared free of charge and without licensure. And that is, that is just huge. Uh, a huge change in that area. Bill, there was a question too from uh, Heather here. She said, is there a map basically like that for New York that shows counties with open data in New York? Uh, no, I have not seen one. Okay, and I, I'm seeing a note here from, from Jeff that actually 22% of Minnesota's population is in, in Hennepin County. So just to give you a, a sense for the significance of the shift in that one county. All right, I, I'm, uh, I'm shifting gears now to, uh, to the White House. So what's, what's been going on with open data at the White House? Um, well, the president has issued an executive order uh, about the same time as the governor of New York did. Our, the governor's is May 11th. Uh, two days before that was the, was the president's executive order on open data. I'm not going to bother you with the definition, but it, it contains all the, all the typical things about machine readable, open formats, metadata, and encouraging uh, agencies to, uh, to make the data available. Um, and the, the federal site, the federal counterpart to data.ny.gov is just called data.gov. And, uh, and I hope you've had a chance to visit this site. I, I put the search term, if you look on here, I, I put in the search term geospatial to see what I would find for data sets. And it returned this morning 82,112 data sets are, are tagged with a keyword that identifies them as geospatial. That's out of a total of 104,000 data sets. So we're, we're looking at about 80% of the data in the federal open data site is tagged as geospatial. Um, so that's a lot of information there. I want to I talk a little bit about this gentleman. His name is Todd Park. He is the White House uh, Chief Technology Officer, the CTO. And he's an interesting character. Um, I saw, I had the pleasure of, of seeing him speak uh, down in Washington about a year ago at the closing session of the Esri Federal User Conference. And uh, he's uh, just an amazing guy, really smart. He uh, is a Harvard educated economist, basically. And he's done some startups and so forth. And he is the driver on the, uh, the federal open data activity. And they just published this year on, on the one year anniversary. Remember, they, the, exec, the president's executive order was May 9th, 2013. Well, on May 9th, 2014, Todd Parks released this US Open Data Action Plan. 
And what does this action plan commit the United States to doing? Well, it has four, four points in it. And I want to go through them point by point. It's very interesting. Uh, first of all, they're going to publish open data in discoverable, machine-readable, useful way. And um, the interesting thing I highlighted here is that they've actually relaunched data.gov on, a, um, on an open source platform. They had been using a, uh, a commercial software package to host uh, data.gov, and they've gone to open source. That way, uh, people can collaborate in the open community to help enhance and, and improve their open data site. The second thing he's doing is uh, working with public and civil society organizations to prioritize open data sets for release. Now, isn't that kind of interesting? So he's asking you, what data do you want the federal government to release on their open data site? Third thing in the action plan is they're supporting uh, innovators. Now, remember, Todd Parks is a Harvard-trained economist. And what, he's, what I see quoted here is that we want to make it simpler for entrepreneurs and innovators to find, understand, and use open government data to develop new products, new services, and new companies. So that's a really interesting point. So Todd Parks sees that there's, there are real economic advantages to publishing open data. We, we get new things created for free by putting this data out there. And the fourth thing is he wants to continue to release and enhance high priority data sets. And what are they doing? Well, they're, they're, they're uh, recruiting a round of presidential innovation fellows. So they're going to do a bunch of demonstration projects. They're, they're bringing in some, some really bright people to work on 12-month uh, fellowships and do um, demonstration projects using open data. Bill, um, also we did have a question here from uh, Timothy Clark. It says, uh, is it really open data if the file is only available in an ESRI file geo database? Uh, you know what? I, what I'm going to do, uh, Mickey, is I want to I want to not lose my my flow here. So let's uh, let's hold the questions here till the end, and then we'll uh, we'll have some uh, Q and A kind of time at the very end of this thing. If that's okay, okay I'm good. Well. All right. So I'm shifting gears to my third location here, which hopefully you recognize as uh, New York City. And New York City enacted something called Local Law 11 uh, in 2012. And this is a big change in the way the city uh, handles their data. It used to be if you wanted city GIS data, uh, you had to go through a licensing procedure. A lot of it was available for download, but you had to click through a license agreement uh, that restricted what you could do with the data. And some of the city agencies charged for their data. And uh, so, in 2012, uh, the city council adopted this local law that requires that all of the data be published as open data. So I've, I've highlighted here, uh, this is right on the city's website on nyc.gov, um, the key points here that they're going to publish everything through a single web portal that's attached to nyc.gov, which is the city's website. They want it in a format that, that can permit automated processing, again, that machine-readable business. The data is, shall be updated as often as is necessary. And finally, they want to make it available without any registration requirements, license requirements, or restrictions on their use. So that's all, all stuff uh, right out of a local law 11. And they, now on nyc.gov, they have, they have this page on open data, which uh, describes a bunch of characteristics and things that they're doing with open data. Um, I like this little description here. They, I'm not going to read you everything on this page. You can go there yourself. But they, they ran something called a big apps competition where um, developers could, uh, using cities' open data, uh, create apps. To, and they, they uh, had prizes for the, for the best ones. And what they say on their website is, this program resulted in hundreds of new applications developed by the public for the public at essentially no cost to the taxpayers. So think about that for a second. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you no longer have to necessarily hire a contractor to create capabilities to serve the public. If you put your open data out there and encourage people to use it, this happens organically. People will, will, will want to create apps with it. Uh, I, that's just uh, something to really think about. And then um, many of you probably know Colin Riley. He is the director of uh, the city's GIS program at the uh, Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. And 
one of the things they've done is uh, they have contributed their street, or excuse me, their address point data to the OpenStreetMap project. So this is Colin at a conference in Washington a couple months ago uh, called the uh, State of the Map Conference, which is the everybody that's been you know kind of a collaborator with the OpenStreetMap project, a global a global open data set project. Uh, and Colin was describing uh, the city's partnership with OSM on uh, on releasing that data there. And what do they get out of it? Well, one of the things they get out of it is earlier notification from the public using the file about where there are new addresses. Where if somebody posts an address, that you know the the, uh, the city agency machinery uh, doesn't pick it up as fast as the public does. All right, so. Um, I get, I, some of you, uh, probably many of you, are subscribed to the State GIS Listserv, and Bruce Oswald posted a note on there this morning about two bills that are under consideration in the New York City Council, and uh, and he uh, says in his note this morning, uh, perhaps this will be in today's session. So I had to do a little scramble this morning. Gee, thanks, Bruce. Uh, but I found the uh, references to these two laws. And these are not law yet, mind you. These are these are bills. Uh, that are being uh, considered by New York City Council, but they both deal with open data and GIS. This first one uh, is about um, release of additional data uh, on the open data portal, and they enhance the definition of data here to specifically include uh, GIS. And they're saying that that data has to be where, wherever you have those data sets represented as a layer on, on the interactive city map, it has to be directly downloadable uh, right on that page. So uh, they want to make it even easier. If you're using the city's interactive mapping website, everything, all those layers on there, you want to be able to immediately click and download them. Uh, right now, you you go to the uh, a different part of the nyc.gov site to, to do the download. So they want to make that easier. And the second one relates to um, uh, violations and crimes. So what this bill would do if the city council enacts is, it is that they would require that every non-criminal summons, violation, or ticket issued by any of the government entities in New York, as well as all the crimes reported by the police department, have to be available on an interactive map. And uh, so can you imagine every, all these infractions all mapped and, uh, and uh, visible on an interactive map? All right, I'm, I'm shifting gears again now. This is um, this next section of the of the presentation is about some of the the research that's been going on with open data. And the first one I want to point out to is something uh, done by the Gov Lab uh, called the Open Data 500 Project. And um, this is a very interesting. This little compass diagram on here is kind of interesting. I'm going to I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's a it's a neat way of looking at data. Um, but first, a little background. So GovLab is uh, affiliated with Columbia University. And this Open Data 500 project, what they did is they, they looked at the 500 largest companies in the United States and what, data, what open data that those companies use from federal agencies. So this study is a bit limited. It's only the 500 largest companies, and it's only federally posted open data. So the data that's on... Uh, data.gov, that, that federal site that I showed you. So let's go back to the compass diagram. Now, on the compass diagram, the right-hand side, the purple side of it, are the federal agencies. And on the left-hand side are the 500 companies grouped by industry sector, energy, food, you know, finance, all those sectors. And if you, if you go to this website and you click on any of these, I, this is just screen captures in my uh, PowerPoint, yeah, but I clicked on Department of Defense, and what it shows is the, the the thickness of the sector is scaled to the number of data sets, um, and the lines connect to where they got it, so uh, or where it went. So the Defense Department does not publish a lot of open data. That probably doesn't come as a shock to any of you. In fact, what came as more of a shock to me is that the Defense Department publishes any open data, frankly. But where does it go? Well, it goes to uh, data and technology companies, a little bit of it goes to research and consulting companies, a little bit of it goes to uh, governance, and uh, so forth. But let's, let's look at another, another one. So here's a, here's a 
a group of federal agencies dealing with, uh, oh, excuse me, the Department of Health and Human Services, they publish a lot of open data. And you can see from the lines that it's used by quite a few of the, of the businesses in the 500 largest companies. If you go to the other side of the diagram, this shows the data flow going out of the, uh, excuse me, the inflow. So in the geospatial and mapping companies, they get open data from everyone. That's, every one of these leader lines is a source of the open data that they use. So a significant amount comes from Department of Commerce. That's largely census data. You probably know about that. But did you realize that these, all these other agencies are providing open data that's useful in the geospatial and mapping? the companies in the, in the 500 largest that have geospatial and mapping activities. Uh, pretty neat. And then just one more here, the lifestyle and consumer sector companies. Again, they're, they're sucking in the data from virtually all of the federal agencies that are publishing it. So you can play around with this compass diagram on your own. I think it's pretty neat. Next thing I want to show you, a little bit of stuff from the Pew Research Foundation. They are very active in tracking uh, what's going on with internet use. So the most recent uh, data is from February, so only a few months ago. And you see on the chart on the left, this is the growth in uh, use of the internet. So what percentage of Americans are accessing the internet? And we're now up to 87% of the population accesses the internet. Um, and all the breakdown by uh, sex and age and ethnicity and so forth, education level is, is detailed on the chart here. But, uh, Pretty much, uh, pretty of Americans are now using the internet. Another element we want to look at is um, smartphone use. So increasingly, people are experiencing the internet on their phones rather than at a, at a computer wired into the wall. And here you see uh, smartphone use. This isn't flip phones. These are smartphones that you can actually access the internet on. Uh, we're up to 58% of Americans are now uh, using a smartphone. And I, I lifted some language off the Pew Research report here. And, and what they say about uh, the overall access to the internet is the rise of mobile devices represents the biggest shift in access over the past 10 years. That's pretty neat. So 68% of US adults now say they access the internet on a cell phone, tablet, or other mobile device, at least occasionally. So we no longer have to think about um, the way our open data might be consumed as necessarily going to occur at a desktop. It's very likely to occur on a smartphone as well. And maybe that shifts our thinking about open data. So let's go down that path a little bit. So here's from another, another research study that shows time spent on the two most popular mobile device operating systems, which are Android and Apple's uh, iOS. And how are people experiencing the internet on these mobile devices? Well, only 20% of time in these devices is spent with a browser application. 80% of it's with apps. So if you are expecting people to consume your data on your website, you're probably mistaken, because most people are going to experience the data in an app if they're using a mobile device. And how is it going to get into an app? Is it going to get into an app if you just uh, make it visible on your website, uh, maybe have an interactive map viewer? No, it is not. You're going to have to publish it as open data so that developers can consume it and build it into these apps, either as a downloadable file or as something consumable with an open API, because that's the only way it will, will, will get incorporated into an app and be, be available for people experiencing the Internet on that mobile device. Um, and then you can see some other stats here from Pew about uh, you know, a lot of people are accessing um, location-based information on their mobile devices. Again, not a, not a huge surprise. I found this study I thought was very interesting. Uh, Deloitte, one of the major accounting firms, uh, did a study in the UK on uh, the market for open data. And what, they, what I lifted out of this is that they find that there are actually new business models emerging around open data. Suppliers, aggregators, developers, and richers and enablers. So think about that. There's a whole economy, new businesses around open data. And they further point out that the consumer-driven sector of the economy, that is you and me, uh, 
will benefit most from open government data. So that's, that's really something you want to let sink in. So open data is resulting in a whole, whole uh, realm of new businesses, suppliers, aggregators, developers, enrichers, and enablers. And who benefits the most? Consumers. So I want to, I want to uh, start coming to some conclusions here. So the first thing is let's, let's think about our government data as public infrastructure, just like roads and sewers and parks and schools. And I'm, I'm, I need to credit uh, Jeff Haas from, um, from the Metro GIS office with this, but uh, his analogy is think about um, data the same way you think about a county highway. Would you build a county highway and only allow county residents to drive on it? So think about that. You, you, sure, you could, but if you wanted to limit it to county residents as the only ones to drive on it, you'd have to set up some kind of a toll barrier system You'd have to develop a management system so you could collect the toll. You'd have to figure out how you're going to avoid charging the county residents. Maybe they got to have some kind of a pass system, so you got to create and administer that. You'd have to have enforcement mechanisms for people who want to drive on it for free, but uh, you, you need to charge, so you got to have enforcement. So you're going to have to you're going to have to commit a whole bunch of resources to administering this whole thing so that you can control it just for county use. And why would you do that? Did you really build that road to generate revenue? Probably not. More likely, that road is part of the infrastructure that makes your, makes your county a place where people want to live, and that road brings people in to your community to, to patronize the businesses and so forth. So it's just part of the infrastructure that's vital to making your community whole, to make it work, to make it grow. And so if you, if you adopt that mindset, how is data any different? Releasing that data gets you into this new economy sector that's evolving around open data. Another aspect to think about, and this is part of the, the state's equation on um, open data, FOIL is freedom of information law. So very often the data, um, if you file a freedom of information law request and you go through the lengthy process and there's lots of elements of the law, I'm not going to, this isn't about freedom of information law, but uh, you may eventually prevail. And agencies regularly require people to go through this process before they obtain a, a particular data set. So there's a lot of churn involved. A lot of people are spending time and effort and your tax money uh, when the end game on it is the data is going to get released under the freedom of information law. So why bother with that? Why don't we just do away with that and publish that as an open data set and, and get back those hours that, that were spent administering the, the provisions of the FOIL law? So I want you to think about um, did, did open data as the currency in this digital economy. So if you accept that premise that, that the open data is the currency, you as a, if you're a government employee uh, or a policymaker in the government sector, have to think about to invest, do I, want to, do I want to make a strategic investment on behalf of the citizens of my jurisdiction and invest in this new economy? And the only way you're going to make that investment is to publish your data as open data. If you, if you take the, the counter position of, I want to generate revenue from this, and to, to generate revenue, I have to restrict, and I have to use a license agreement, and I have to have mechanisms to, to collect and, uh, and I'll have an audit trail and all these things associated with the revenue, because I think that's going to be a, a greater public good. Well, I think the ball has shifted, and that, that's what Randy Johnson concluded, that, that that revenue generation has become less and less viable, and by doing so, you're withholding your jurisdiction from participating in this digital economy. So I'm coming to the, coming to the end here. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm 54 years old. I've seen a lot of changes in my lifetime, a lot of shifts. I just pick out two of them here. Seatbelt, let's start with seatbelts. When I was growing up, nobody wore a seatbelt. They were tucked, you know, they were stuffed in the crack between the seat, the bench seat bottom and bench seat back. I don't think I ever saw until I was uh, maybe in high school anybody wearing a seatbelt. Uh, nowadays, everybody gets in the car, they don't even think about it. You, you just click. Society has made that change. 
And at first, people that resisted, I can remember the outcry uh, when the seatbelt laws first went in and it was infringing on my rights to choose how I want, whether I want to put this seatbelt on or not. Nobody even questions it anymore. You just get in the car and you, you buckle up. Um, the other one I've, I've highlighted on here is smoking. When I was growing up, cigarette smoking was rampant. Uh, my father smoked two packs a day. They were Everywhere you went, there were ashtrays out. Uh, you know, uh, people smoked. I, I, I remember people smoking in the grocery store, pushing their cart down the aisle. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody thought about the rights of, of uh, non-smokers to not have to be breathing this smoke. Uh, but again, we've changed. Our, our consciousness about the public health problems with smoking have changed. And now uh, we have anti-smoking laws, which we all pretty much take for granted. You, <clears throat> you don't see uh, smoking in so many of the places that uh, were common when I grew up. So the point is, things change. When I was uh, earlier in my career at the State Department of Transportation, we produced a lot of data sets as the state's mapping agency that a lot of other people wanted. And we didn't freely release it. We licensed it and sold it. And at the time, I thought that was a legitimate thing to do. And so did a lot of other people. But you know what? Things have changed. I've certainly changed my my thinking on this, and um, and I think it's time for some others to do the same thing. So we now we've now raised a whole generation of people who grew up with the internet, who just take it as a as a fact of life that information is freely available on the internet. That's the these are the people that are going to be our future leaders, our, our future elected officials, and so forth. That's the expectation. The data is there. Let me have it. And another thing you need to think about is that. A lot of businesses now, when they're deciding, you know, whether to open a business in your community or to, or to locate a facility in your community, they do their prospecting, not necessarily by calling up your chamber of commerce or your economic development agency and, and, and asking for a bunch of information. They might do this entirely anonymously online and conclude that you're not open for business and move on to somewhere else and you don't even know it. So you may be you may be locking out by, by locking that gate to your data. You may be locking out potential economic benefits without even knowing it. So I think you think you need to think about open data as a as really a sea change, and um, and I think uh, the tide's coming in. You know we're going to see open data continue to grow, and these policies are going to spread just like they did in. In, and are doing in Minnesota, New York City, the state's efforts. I think this is where we're going to be. And with that, I thank you. And I guess I'll look at the uh, at the chat for questions now. So some of, the, uh, some of the questions, Bill, there were back in the beginning were about open data and how a lot of the data is in Esri format and that type of thing there. And yeah, so uh, you know, I, I think there are purists who would say releasing data as a you know a geodatabase, an Esri geodatabase, is not does not meet the full definition of of open data because that requires that somebody convert it to something else. I would certainly say it's a good it's a step in the right direction to make your data available without restrictions, and um, if you can do that uh, and work your way into having it in open formats, that's I, I think definitely a step in the right direction. But if you really want to be calling yourself, you know, a, a full participant in the open data world, you really need to release it in, in one of the open formats. Mickey, I'm going to I'm going to rely on you to queue up the questions for me because there's a lot of stuff on here. So okay. You, yeah. You filter through it I know and one of the. For me. I know somebody mentioned something about how with DEC that they have it in KML format so that you know you can easily display it. Um, and Google Maps there and that type of thing, and as well as uh, use it in other applications. Um, yeah, KML is is absolutely considered one of the one of the great open data formats. It is a published open standard, so it started out as a you know Google's uh, proprietary um, publishing standard, but they turned it over to the Open Geospatial Consortium, which evaluated it and made some enhancements to it and, and released it as an open published standard. So it's absolutely an open standard. And then another question just came in was, you know, what if you haven't produced the data that you're using in a web map? Should it still be downloadable from your site? 
What was the first part of that question? It says, uh, what if you haven't produced the data that you are using in a web map? Should it still be downloadable from your site? Well, uh, if it's not your data, if it's data you obtained the else and you haven't got you know, their permission to, to release it as open data, that's really not fair. Uh, you know, if, if, it's, if it's an open data set, uh, it, you know, the, the common view is there's no wrong access point. So when you release an open data set, you're not, you're not requiring that people come to you to get it. Uh, you, you've put it out into the wild. And somebody else may may post it on their site or build it into their map and have a download link to it. That's all fine. Um, but if you've got a data set that you obtained from somebody and they haven't necessarily released it to you as open data, I think you have an obligation to to make sure it's okay for you to have it downloadable off of your site. And I'm not sure if this question is for Jeff or or whatever, but I did see there was some discussion about, um, I know Sean Myers here had a question here. He says, do you foresee municipalities putting restrictions on use of data? For example, OpenStreetMap is licensed as an open database license, which requires any data that results from the meshing of the raw data with third-party data to be public as well. This is a requirement that is contentious and That's makes true. private there companies is a, I was I was carefully dodging around that one because there is some controversy about the license affiliated with the OpenStreetMap, and that would be the subject for something much longer than we're going to do right now in the Q and A. But just be aware that that is that is a point of contention. Not everybody would agree that OpenStreetMap is open data, given the given the terms of the license that they use around it. And I'll just I'll leave it at that. If you if you go online and do some do some uh, poking around on that issue, you'll find plenty of stuff to read on your own. And we got another one too here is, uh, you know, is there a summary available? This is uh, from Michael Hemmer, it says, uh, is there a summary available to send to local legislators to make the case for opening up the data? Um, I think I think the best, re best summary is that 75 page report from Metro GIS. It really does a, an excellent job of very logically laying out the issues, uh, and it's it's written for policymakers. So I think that's that's where I would point you uh, is that report, and then you can back it up with. And here's here's what happened as a result of that report. That metro area reversed course. So it doesn't get much better than that. And I I know Bill also I had a question uh, related way back to Heather's question way back about whether uh, New York had a map showing the counties with the open data. Um, that's available and stuff like that. Um, something New York State might be looking at doing, like on a clearinghouse site or something like that, to have something like that available um, that know, will show. I, I I like the idea. We've had no discussions about doing that. Uh, I think it might be an interesting activity to, to to look at. I don't want to make any commitments, but I, I like the idea. And. Uh, Let's see, and then uh, I see a question from Alex Chaucer here. He says, uh, do you set the right licensing for your own data set, or does does Creative Commons licensing come into play? I'm trying to catch these as they uh, scroll here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I understand that completely, Alex, but um, what, if, you're the, if you're the data originator, um, you can make a decision about whether or not you, you want to put any of those uh, licensing provisions like a Creative Commons license. Under the Creative Commons license isn't a license. They have different levels of Creative Commons licensing, and I would encourage you to go look at that. Uh, the most commonly used one is the one that requires attribution. In other words, you, you need to list the, the source of the data. So as your data propagates out there in the wild, there's kind of a, a, a lineage, you know, provenance as it's called in the art world. People know where it came from. Um, and uh, so that's a decision you can make. Um, but you know, I think as a data owner, you need to you need to make some policy decisions about whether or not that's important to you. And if it is, there are mechanisms to do that, like this Creative Commons Level One license. And there's another question from Michael Naughton here. He says that one issue that has come up a lot is versioning. Data creators are worried that there could be old files on the internet, and there does not seem to be a good way of handling that. What do you think about this? That's a that's a good a good issue to point out. So once your data set's out there and you've released it, um, you know that's why I think 
that's why metadata is important. You want metadata that stays with your file if possible, that lists, you know, what's, you know, is this data actively maintained? If it is, on what, on what kind of a frequency? So the people that, that are obtaining that file know that, oh, this is, a, this is an annual file or a quarterly file or a monthly or weekly file and would know to come back for an update because there is no automated mechanism for that to happen. Now, that's on a downloadable. If, if you publish your open data via an open access API, this is, a, this is a, a, a much better way to ensure that people are using the most current data. So as, assuming people consume it through apps that are just ingesting your API calls, uh, you're presumably always publishing on your site that's uh, accessible with the open API the most current file. So people that access your data through that, uh, that's a great advantage of, of that strategy. And I see we got some links. I see Jeff has posted some uh, ways to contact him if people have questions and a link to the Metro GIS site. Um, also, there was a question here. I see uh, David Lunsbury is, what's the relationship between data.ny.gov and the New York State Data Sharing Cooperative? Well, uh, the data.ny.gov does have some GIS data sets that came from the, from the State GIS Clearinghouse. Now, this gets a little confusing, and I, mean, I we've been explaining our way out of a dozen years or more, but the clearinghouse has a mix of both freely available data and data that's limited to this uh, group of people that have signed an agreement that is called the New York State uh, Data Sharing Cooperative. And that cooperative is essentially a license agreement that uh, creates a sandbox of, of uh organizations that are agreeing to a common set of, of rules for how they share data. That's not, that model, that data sharing cooperative model does not fit the open data world. And I expect that over time we're going to retire the cooperative and we'll be, we'll be moving toward open data. Um, the connection between the GIS clearinghouse and the state's open data site is something that we're going to be working on. Um, there is right now, it's not a direct connection between the clearinghouse and the open data site, uh, but there are some data sets that are in both places right now. And I think where we're, where we're moving is to have tighter integration on all these things coming together uh, through the state's open data site. And I see that there's been a couple links posted related to um, the licensing there. There's an opendatacommons.org. It's posted by uh, Greg here, and then Alex also posted one about creativecommons.org licenses. Uh, those right. are on there, too, on the chat here. All right. Is there anything and else? There is a person typing. I'm not sure if it's a question or <laughs> okay. yeah, but uh, <laughs> we'll maybe give it like a minute here and just see if there's any other questions people have, and then um, we'll wrap this up. We'll, this. Uh, presentation will be available. It will be posted into the New York State GIS Association uh, YouTube channel there. Um, well, how long would it take you to get that up there? Uh, I maybe. usually have, I'd say typically it's probably like three, four days. I usually have yeah. it uh, sent out the day of and then it has to get, has to get converted over to the YouTube channel and because of the file size, it takes a while for it to download. So, Okay. It looks like people are just commenting now and not asking All right. questions. Yeah, so. and, and I'm going to leave here to this. People log out, they'll see uh, a survey that they can fill out on the presentation. So I'm going to leave it open for a little bit here afterwards. And then I'll close it out, say, in like 10 minutes or so. And I'll give people a chance to kind of fill out that survey as they're leaving. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate your hour. Yeah, thank you, Bill, for presenting. It was very useful, and uh, I think I think everything seems to be headed in the right right direction. And and uh, I'm going to make sure that I get this distributed to our local governments in the area because we have a um, Tug Hill Times um, paper that we put out basically every uh, two weeks with information. So I'm going to be putting a link to this here because I think it's important for local governments and stuff like that to see